Father, this morning, we simply come into your presence rejoicing and confessing that often we fill our lives with the junk, with the trash of this world. And our prayer is that you would teach us how to crave the word of God, how we would desire to be filled with you, with your love, your peace, your life, with your spirit. And so, God, we simply come into your presence and we bring ourselves and we give ourselves to you, asking that you would teach us and change us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be starting a a new series looking at this letter uh, to the church at Philippi. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that is uh, fine. Just grab one of these uh, in the pews around you. Look just like this. Turn to page 1,247 and you'll find Philippians. If uh, you need a Bible, you don't have one, you want to read the Word of God and you don't have access to one, then please take one of these. It's our gift to you. We'd love for you to have the Word of God and let it influence your life. Uh, As I mentioned, we're kicking off a new series today, looking at this uh, letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi, and we're calling this series A Letter to Friends. A Letter to Friends, uh, because Paul was a friend to the church at Philippi, and uh, he shared his heart with them, and they shared themselves with with him in ministry. We're not talking about casual acquaintances, you know, the people that you see in the grocery store, you go, oh, hey, and yeah, I don't know who they are. You know, the people you recognize their face, but you don't really know them well. And so uh, we're talking about real friends, friends that that tell you the truth, right? Uh, You got those kind of friends in your life, the the people that when you get the new haircut, they go, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Uh, or they tell you, uh, don't wear that dress. I uh-uh, know. No, it's not the pants that make your belly. Like, oh, uh. <laughs> you know, the friends that tell you the truth about the relationships that you're in, the ones who don't tell you what you want to hear or just take your side, the, the friends that tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it. It's good to have those friends in your life. We need those friends in your life. In fact, I, I value that so much that uh, I married a friend like that. Uh, my wife, Meralda, uh, a year into our relationship, we, I don't think we'd been dating a year, and, and, uh, and I had like my dream come true. I got to be like the, the lead person in our youth group musical, you know, and I had a couple of solos and everything. It wasn't by design because the guy who was supposed to have the part dropped out the last minute, so it, it kind of fell into my lap. And I thought, great, I get to shine for Jesus. I get to sing these songs. I poured myself into it, poured my heart into it. You know, of course, it's Sunday night in church and all the adults were like, oh, that was so nice. And then I go, so Meralda, how did I do? And, and she looked at me with love in her eyes for me, and she said, you probably should never do that again. <laughs> so I married her and, uh, you know, kind of figured uh, she's going to be that honest. And you know what? She's right. I, I just, that's not my gifts. That's not my talent. That's not what uh, God made me to do. And, uh, and I appreciated that kind of friendship and honesty. And Paul was that kind of friend to the Philippians. As we walk through this letter in the coming months, uh, you're going to hear him share his heart with them. You're going to see him rebuke them and challenge them in very personal ways. And as we kick this off, uh, looking at Philippians 1, uh, first uh, couple of uh, verses, listen for the words that express this close relationship, this intimate relationship as friends. Beginning in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus... To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Did did you hear those terms of endearment? Did did you catch them? He says in verse 3, I thank God when I remember you. Whenever I remember you, I thank God. Now that's kind of cool because there are people in our lives that we thank God that they're not in our lives. Right? (laughs) I, I mean, we're like, yeah, I'm glad they're not around anymore. And he says in verse 4, I pray with joy for you. He, he, he says, you're partners in the gospel with me, and it's right to feel this way. I hold you in my heart. You're partakers of grace with me. In verse 8, he says, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ. And then in verses 9 through 11, he prays for them. He prays that their love would abound more and more, that they would know the will of God and be able to figure it out, and that God would let their lives be a blessing to him and filled with the fruit of righteousness. I mean, this is a, a, a letter that, where he communicates that he loves these people. And in the midst of this affectionate greeting, Paul tells them a truth that he wants his friends to grasp. Because he knows that if they get this, that if they understand this truth, it will transform their relationship with the living God. Paul wants them to be secure. To be secure. Look at verse 6 again. He says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling them, hey, Philippians, if you have had that life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, then that is a relationship that will last forever. Forever. Now, some of you right now are saying amen, and some of you are saying, oh, no. Because, you, you know, you, maybe you were raised differently, and you've uh, grown up in churches where uh, you didn't really agree with that you know, eternal security uh, stuff. And, and, uh, and I just want you to know whether you are from uh, a background that, that taught once saved, always saved, you're from a background that didn't, or whether you're just new to all this discussion. For 500 years, Protestant Christianity has been uh, debating this subject. And there's a group of two camps, one that believes that your relationship is secure in Christ and another that believes that you can lose your salvation. Uh, and I just want you to know we're not going to settle that debate today. Okay, that's not the purpose of this message. So if uh, wherever you kind of fall on that spectrum, don't tune me out because I want to challenge everyone. In fact, I want to offend everyone. I'm an equal opportunity offender. And, uh, and, and by the way, if, if you listen to this message and you don't agree with me, that's okay. Because biblical Christians who love Jesus and who follow Jesus and who serve Jesus and who believe the Bible is the Word of God don't always agree. And that's all right, because what unites us is our mission and our love for Christ and our love for people. So, uh, but I want, you to, I want you to listen, because I want to challenge you and try to expand your mind and, and offer some, um, some things that maybe will help us move forward. But the main thing is that we look at God's Word, and we hear what it says, and we apply it to our lives. Now, part of the disagreement in Christendom and, and in churches and church people is based on some misunderstandings, the way that we talk about the debate. So I want to talk about two misunderstandings that, that kind of fuel the debate and I think misrepresent what God desires for us. And, and they kind of are uh, uh, a challenge at the two extremes uh, in how they kind of look at things. So first of all, first misunderstanding is that God doesn't offer hell insurance. Okay. <laughs> God doesn't offer hell insurance. Now, no one's ever really stood up in a pulpit that I've been around and and tried to sell hell insurance. But but at the same time, the churches I grew up in, the crusades I was at, the revivals I attended, the youth camps I went to, vacation Bible schools, it certainly seemed like some people are representing salvation like it's just a hell insurance policy you can buy. You know, uh, you ever been there where they just tell you, hey, all you got to do is pray this prayer, which equates to say these magic words and God has to save you. I, I've been there when it was, it was just, it was wrong manipulation where, you know, you say to a bunch of kids in vacation Bible school, okay, everybody who doesn't want to go to hell, raise your hand. Uh, because none of us want to go to hell, and, and yet you can easily mislead children. And, and we don't do that here, and, and we don't want to even do that with adults because, uh, unfortunately, what happens is people go, yeah, I don't want to go to hell, so let me buy the insurance. And, and I'm afraid that when they get to the day of judgment, they're going to try to hold up some kind of insurance policy like, see, here's my baptismal certificate from the church, and you got to honor that God. And God's like, I didn't issue it, and I'm not going to honor it. 
I know this to be real because uh, I've knocked on enough doors, especially in South Georgia, when I was there and, and had this kind of conversation with people. Hey, I want to invite you to the church. Oh, I don't need to go to your church. Oh, where do you go to church? I don't. Well, what about you and God? Oh, I'm good with God. When I was nine years old, I went to vacation Bible school and I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart and I'm good and I haven't been back to church since. Okay, that says a lot about a relationship with the living God, doesn't it? And, and I'm afraid that there's these people that are trusting in something that, that God never said, that the Bible doesn't represent. Yes, it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but it also talks about what that looks like. And a life-changing relationship actually changes our lives. So uh, God doesn't offer hell insurance. Now on the other side of it, God doesn't want you living insecure. He doesn't want you living in fear. And, and the other tragedy is that uh, of, uh, there's a lot of churches that convince dedicated followers of Christ to live with the constant fear that they're going to lose their salvation. And this is marked by or evidenced by maybe you grew up in these kind of churches where, you know, every week uh, you felt like you had to go back to the altar and you had to pray again and, and ask God to forgive you again so that you wouldn't go to hell because you rebelled during the week. You made some mistakes during the week or maybe you just were afraid that you'd done something that you couldn't remember and you had to make sure that God wasn't going to kick you to the curb. And every week you're kind of going back to the beginning and you're starting the journey over and you're saying, God, I, I want to be part of you. Please, please, please. And they're living with fear about the relationship with God. Hey, let me just kind of put it this way. Do you think you can have a healthy marriage relationship if you don't trust your spouse? If you don't believe them when they tell you something, if you don't trust them that they're for you, if you're not sure that they're going to you know, honor their word, is that going to be a healthy marriage? It's not. Trust is essential for there to be a close, intimate relationship. And that means... With God, too. we got to trust him at his word. we got to trust him that he's for us and, and that he includes us and he wants us and, and he's going to take care of us. That's why Paul wants the Philippian Christians to be secure. That's why I want followers of Christ in Lake Havasu City to be secure in their relationship, to know that God loves us and values us. To know that even when we mess up and rebel, God holds on to us because when we know that at the depth of our soul, when we grasp that truth, it, then we can live in joy. We can see once you get this. I don't know what that was, but that wasn't good. But he wants us to live in joy. He wants us to serve out of gratitude. He wants us to stay awake for the sermon. Uh, He wants us to grow intimate with him, and that only happens when we are secure in our love relationship with the living God. Hey, Autumn, am I still on? Is this thing still working? Okay, good. Okay. Just want to make sure, because otherwise, otherwise I'll yell, and then I'll lose my voice, and that's not cool either. So let me just share with you why I believe this. Uh, let me talk about some biblical affirmations of security. Uh, now, I want to share with you a few representational passages of Scripture that, that I think are convincing to why we can live a secure life in our love relationship with Jesus. Uh, but uh, at the same time, let me just acknowledge that there are passages in the Bible that, that, that introduce the idea that it might be possible to fall away or to, to fall from grace. And, and, uh, and yet in my studies, what I've done is I put all those on the table together and uh, I come away convinced that, that security wins, that it's overwhelming when we look at them all that uh, we can be secure in that relationship. So what I want to challenge you to do is listen uh, and, and then go home and reread these and you and God have a conversation about your relationship with him and, and let him lead you. Uh, I'm going to start off with Philippians 1.6 again, because this is such a great verse, and it's our theme verse today. That's why we have the t-shirts the and stuff. Uh, and Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So who does Paul say is going to complete our salvation? God is. That the one who began the work is going to finish it. So what God starts, God finishes. 
See, when you confess Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. He starts a work of transformation in your life. Here's the promise that what he starts, he's going to finish. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Again, the Apostle Paul, he, he says these great words. He says, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So who, does Paul say, is the guarantee of our salvation? The Holy Spirit. I am so glad that that is in the Bible. Because if I was the one who had to guarantee my salvation by how I'm going to live and how I'm going to obey and how I'm going to be a good Christian, then I'm in trouble. Okay, because there's no way. I don't live up to it. If my salvation depended on my faithfulness, <laughs> I'm screwed. But it doesn't depend on me. It depends on the Holy Spirit who God put in me when I confessed him. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm here and you're mine and I'm going to guarantee your salvation. That is good news for me. I think it's good news for you too. Romans chapter 8. The apostle says again, and this is a beautiful long passage, but, but listen to this. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's happening right now if you read the headlines. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is so cool. So what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, and just let that soak into your souls. What a statement. You know what that means? That means that God loves you completely and totally, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. Now, some of us were raised in homes that were performance-based kind of love. In other words, uh, you, you got affection uh, and approval if you complied with what you know, your parents wanted you to do. That's not how God operates. And some of you are trying to get God to love you by what you're doing. You're thinking, hey, if I do this, maybe God will love me more. No, God loves you completely right now, just like you are. He loves you. And he's not going to love you anymore by, because of what you do. But here's the flip side. God's not going to love you any less because of what you do. Oh, let that soak down into your soul. He's not going to love you any less because you rebel, because you choose foolishly, because you hurt yourself. He's going to grieve, but he's going to love you. Because he wants the best for you. And nothing in this world, nothing we go through, nothing that's going to happen in the future is going to be able to separate us from God's love. Let's listen to Jesus. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if you come to Jesus... Who's going to raise you up on the last day? Jesus is. I, mean, I don't know about you, but we're, we're talking about this, this faith stuff is placing your faith and trust in Jesus to rescue you, to save you, to give you eternal life. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I'm responsible for at the end giving you life. And I will do it. That's kind of cool. Jesus again, John chapter 10. He says this. Remember, Jesus called himself the great shepherd. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus says, I protect my sheep. You're mine, you're good. You're never going to perish. So my conviction when I read these and verses like these is, if you have experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then that relationship is forever. 
It's going to last forever. God started it. He's going to finish it. So let me ask you this question because the key word is if. If you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Has God started a work in your life? Have you heard the truth of the gospel and believed in Jesus? Do you know personally the love of God in your life? Not about the love of God, but have you experienced the reality that God loves you? Has God been drawing you to Jesus? Now, you're sitting in church on Sunday morning. Maybe, could be that something's drawing you here. Um, Maybe it's God. Have you heard God's voice and are you following him? And when I say heard God's voice, it doesn't mean that you heard it audibly, but you just kind of sense like he was talking to you, telling you something, and you said yes. Are you following him? Now, see, here's the thing. If the answer is yes to those questions, if you can say with confidence, yes, I know that God started working me. Yes, I believe in the gospel. I believe in Jesus, and, and I know his love, and, and I know he's changed me, and I, then, then please be secure in your relationship with the living God. That relationship's never going to go away. It's not going to end. God's not going to abandon you. You are his, and you can live secure. You can rejoice. You can serve, uh, not out of guilt, because you have to, but because you want to. You you can live for Christ in, in, in all the joy that he gives you because you belong to Jesus, and he will never let you go. If you can't answer yes to those questions, then I'm not going to sell you security today. I don't want you to feel secure because here's the thing. You know, you need to decide today that you're going to hear God's voice and you're going to follow him, that he's going to be your shepherd, he's going to be your life, and you're going to surrender to Jesus and let him change your life. And if you're not sure about the answer to those questions, then that's what you need to do right now. Just simply say, Jesus, I need you to change me, and so I give my life to you. I want, I want your love in my life. I, I want to be one of yours. And that's what it means that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, if the answer is yes, be secure. If it's not, do something about it, because he's invited you to. Now, let's address some questions. Uh, I want to end with this, because every time I have a conversation on this subject, the, the same kind of questions come up again. And so I want to address those specifically. But if we don't answer your questions and you need to talk or want to talk with someone, please make an appointment with one of the pastors. We love to talk about the Word of God and share our hearts with you. Uh, not to try and convince you that we're right, but to try and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. So let's talk about some questions, because uh, these come up a lot. First of all, what about those who fall away? What about those who fall away? You know, I'm talking about people who attend church, get baptized. They're like, you know, living it like everyone else. Uh, you know, they're going to life group. They're serving. And then one day, they're just not. And, and you go, hey, what's up? We're missing you at church. You run into them out in the, the town. And, and they kind of go, oh, I just don't believe that anymore. And you're like, what happened? Or maybe somebody comes into church and they're really excited and they're on fire and they're just, Jesus is great, Jesus is awesome. And the next thing you know, they're kind of drifting back into their old lifestyle of addiction or, or destructive habits. And you're going, what up? What is up with that? How do I understand this when I'm talking about security? How does the Bible explain this? Well, it kind of gives us two biblical options. They were either pretenders or they're prodigals. Pretenders or prodigals. Uh, the Apostle John talks about the pretenders. In his first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 19, he says this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. He says, look, just because they came to church with us, just because they they called themselves Christians, just because they they hung out with with us for a while, doesn't mean that they ever experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if you're in church a whole lot, you're doing all this stuff, and you haven't experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus, then you're just being religious. And after a while, it gets old, and you're like, ah, I'm done with this. And that's what happened with the the Christians that John's talking about. There were people there, and guess what? In his day, when he wrote that, times were tough, and the church was being persecuted. And, and, you know, maybe people were getting beheaded, like uh, you hear on the news. And and they were like, yeah, we're we're done with this. We're not that committed. And he said, they went out from us. They didn't didn't really know the truth. They hadn't really experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Pretenders. 
Jesus alluded to this too in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, when he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. He says, look, it doesn't matter how you label yourself. What matters is how God labels you. The book of Revelation says that when you belong to Jesus, he writes his name on your life. You belong to him. So one answer to those who fall away is pretenders. The other answer is prodigals. Uh, you're probably familiar with the story in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. Man had two sons. Younger one came to him and said, uh, I want my stuff. I want my inheritance. Dad gave it to him. Son went away to a faraway land and embraced a lifestyle completely opposite of his dad's values. Wasted his inheritance, ended up in poverty, extreme poverty, and came to his senses and went, I'm an idiot. The servants in my dad's house live better than I do. I'm going home and beg to be a servant. So he goes home. Dad sees him coming from far away because dad's watching for him. And he runs out and greets him. And, and, you know, every time we do repentance, right, we rehearse. I don't know about you guys. I always rehearse, you know, what you're going to say to your parents when you messed up. That's what he does. Dad, I don't deserve to be your son. I want to go live with the slaves. I want to be a servant because you treat them really well, so I'm sorry. And dad's like, okay, go be a servant. No, that's not what dad said. (laughs) Right? You know the story. Dad didn't say that. He threw his arms around him and he hugged him. And he said, my son is home. We're going to celebrate. We're going to throw a party. This is great. And he embraced them as a son because here's the thing. Even though the son rejected the father, the father never gave up on the son. And some of you in this room, uh, you met Jesus a long time ago, and yet you wandered far, far away. And, and, and it might have been years, it might have been decades. And yet you always knew that God was with you and he loved you, even when you were living in utmost rebellion. And when you came home, you ran into the Father's arms and he embraced you and said, welcome home. So what about those who fall away? Well, they're pretenders or they're prodigals. Here's the kicker. You and I, we can't tell the difference from where we sit. We can't look at somebody's heart and know whether they're a pretender or whether they're a prodigal. Our responsibility is to love them and pray for them and encourage them. That's it. Not to judge them because we don't know. And and, and so uh, the Bible gives us two answers, two options for every person that we think has fallen away. Next question, one that comes up a lot. So can we commit apostasy? Apostasy is where, where, can we be a follower of Jesus and then reject Christ and his gift of salvation? Can we give it back? We're not talking about losing it accidentally by doing something stupid. We're talking about an intentional act where we as followers of Jesus Christ reject Jesus as Lord. And my answer is a resounding no. I don't believe we can commit apostasy. Here's why. Um, Scripture uses this language a lot. It says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Okay, so here's the deal. When Jesus died on the cross, his shed blood paid for your sins. And when you confess Jesus, God wrote his name on you and you became his property. You may not be comfortable with that, but here's the reality. When you confess Jesus as Lord, you become his servant. He owns us. That's why scripture says you're not your own. You were bought with a price. So if I go down to Walmart and I buy myself a TV... Does that TV ever going to take itself back to Walmart and trade itself in? (laughs) Nope. That TV is yours. I I can do that, whatever I want with that TV. I can throw that TV away. I can sell it. I can use it. I can take it back to Walmart and get another one. I can do whatever I want because I'm the owner. The TV is my possession. When you step into that relationship with Jesus Christ, he is the owner of your life. That's what Scripture says. And so, and and by the way, God's already told us what he's going to do with us, hasn't he? He's never going to stop loving us. He's going to raise us up on the last day. No one and nothing can take you away from him. He's got a hold of you. That's why we can be secure. Some of you are going, are you sure? Because the Bible says some stuff about apostasy. Yeah, okay, so here's the deal. If you could commit apostasy, if you could do it, I just want you to know it's really bad. I mean, it's really, really, really bad. You need to hear this. Hebrews chapter 6 is the passage that is the most uh, strongest passage in the, in the Bible about, you know, uh, apostasy or losing your salvation, whatever you wanna, however you want to put it. 
Uh, and so I want to share it with you because I want you to hear the warning that it is and, and then talk about it. Here, here's what he says. The writer says, for it is impossible. That's scary words right there. In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, I don't have time to exegete the entire passage, uh, but uh, did you catch that impossible to renew? So if it is possible to commit apostasy, then it's over and out. You're done. You can never repent and return to Christ. And some of you in this room right now, as soon as I said that, you're like, what if I did that? Because you were raised to be afraid, okay? I'm just telling you that. I know how, you, how we think. And you're suddenly fearful that you'll accidentally apostatize. You can't. Okay, if you could commit apostasy, I want you to hear this because of what it says. If you could commit apostasy, you would not even want to be here. You, you wouldn't darken the doors of a church because you wouldn't care a thing about God. You wouldn't care a thing about forgiveness. You wouldn't care a thing about repentance. You wouldn't care any about that stuff because you're done with it. It's over. The very fact that you want to be included in Christ, that you want your sins forgiven, that you want heaven to be your destination, that you want to be a child of God, means that you are secure. I hope that resonates with you. Because God wants you to live a secure life where you can relish the relationship and you can have that trust and the, the, the love can grow deeper and you can honor his words and you can believe them because you know he's going to take care of you. Now, some invariably at this point go, but preacher, if you tell people that they're secure, then you know what they'll do. If they believe that that grace applies to them no matter what, they'll go out and sin all they want. And I go, yeah. Just like us. Because we sin all we want, don't we? We sin all we want. I know I do. I sin all that I want. Every time I'm selfish, it's because I choose to be. You know, my wife needs my help around the house, and I just want to sit there with the, in the recliner flipping channels. I choose to be the selfish pig. Okay? <laughs> it's my choice. Every time I go back for second, third, fourth, or whatever, uh, and I'm a glutton, it's my choice. I'm choosing to do that. I'm sinning all I want. I know it's not good for me. I know I shouldn't do it. I do it anyway. Every time I drive over the speed limit, which is pretty much all the time, then <laughs> I'm a lawbreaker. And by definition, sin is law-breaking. And, and so I know I'm doing it on purpose. Guys, we sin all that we want to. But the thing is, we know that sin is poison to our souls. We know it's destructive to our lives. We, we know how damaging it is to us. And so we don't want to. But we do. But we don't want to. But see, here's the thing. When I'm in the presence of God and I'm tasting of his grace and how awesome it is that I am forgiven and, and that Jesus paid for my sins through his sacrifice on the cross, that does not inspire me to sin. That inspires me to serve. I want to say thank you to God. I love you and you are so awesome. And, and, and I'm, I'm just grateful to the depths of my being. It's when I get away from God, when I drift away and I kind of get self-absorbed and, and I forget about him, that's when I start indulging the evil desires. But being in the presence of God and his grace and mercy, that inspires me to live for him and to tell others about him. So we're not afraid of grace around here. And we want you to be secure in that love relationship that you have with Jesus because we know if you're secure, then you're going to serve out of joy, you're going to live a life of love, and you're going to invite people to come and experience the grace that you've received. So today, if you know that you've had that life-changing relationship with Jesus, please embrace security. Let God show up and begin teaching you more about how you can trust him. But if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ... Whether today is the first day you've ever heard the gospel explained or whether you've been a pretender for decades. If you're not sure of your relationship with Jesus, then don't leave this place without settling that. Because you can step into that love relationship and know that your eternity is secure by making that life commitment to Jesus Christ. Do you hear his voice and will you follow him? Let's pray. 
God, thank you for the grace that we do not deserve. Thank you for the love that overwhelms and is demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Thank you for including us in your family. Thank you for the promise that you're never going to cast us out. So God, today, let us hear your voice. Those of us who are your sheep, let us follow you with all of our lives out of love and gratitude. And those who aren't, Lord, bring them in. Give them the grace and the courage to take that step of committing their life to Jesus for the very first time so that they can experience your love on an intimate level. God, we don't deserve any of it, but we thank you for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.